Okay, uh, if the third guy in this session appears, just pop up because we're not sure if he comes. Okay, uh, this is a lecture about uh, legal problems uh, regarding uploading pictures to Wikimedia Commons. Um, when I did this lecture, I wasn't sure who the target audience who comes here, who would come to this lecture would be. People from Wikipedia Commons, legal people. So I tried to cover basic definition and basic stuff. If one slide is boring, I hope the, the next slide is not. So first of all, two disclaimers. I told in another lecture as I was doing that I really like disclaimers, being a lawyer. Uh, I'm not a US lawyer, so I don't know US copyright law very well. A bit problematic when you're doing lectures about problems in US copyright law. <laughs> I did try to figure out stuff last night, and you will see that I'm not really secure about it, but the outcome is not that important, because my point is that US copyright law really sucks anyways, so <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> The second disclaimer, which is quite unfortunate, I have a bad feeling that certain images from the commons will be deleted after the lectures. <laughs> so I really hope you don't hold it against me. Okay? Don't write in the common stock page that Dror said we should delete these, these images. It doesn't look good later on. Okay, first of all, this is for lawyers who may be here and have no idea what the commons part of the uh, lecture is about. What is Wikimedia Commons? In brief, it is a repository of images. I look at the front page of Commons, there is a big sign there. Welcome, it's supposed to be friendly. Welcome, later on we'll see it is really not. <laughs> to Wikimedia Commons, it's a database of 30 million images, which is great, one of the biggest. Freely usable media that anyone can contribute. No, really, can anyone contribute? This is a question. I, go, I went to one of the uh, rules pages, the information pages. It's a media file repository to make available to the general public, public domain and freely licensed e educational images. In the previous lectures that I've been to, uh, jean Frederic explained that public domain is something not clearly defined in many legal systems. It's already here we have a problem. What is in the public domain? Later that page said that we want to make either a public a domain images and anything that is freely licensed and also educational when we are speaking about educational, the site itself defined educational in the broadest possible meaning, which means anything that can be used in any presentation is educational. And we want it there, which is a great uh, goal. Now, in order for it to be free contents, um, I'm not reading all the slides. It's going to be later on the, on the website, but it's there. Um, what is Free content is whatever in the public domain, and the site defines for the purpose of the site what is the public domain, if the copyright has expired, if the copyright owner has voluntarily gave out its right, uh, or if the file is ineligible for copyright, usually for lack of origin originality for some reason. Um, then the site defines according to what laws it based its definition on. It says both the United States law and the law of the source country must apply, which means that the image must be free in the public domain or I copyright owner waived its right both according to the US law and the source country. It does not say so, but actually the practice of commons is that the US law prevails. I have spoken to legal people from the foundation yesterday, uh, yesterday and they said that this must be the case. The US law must prevail. And I don't dispute that. The, the foundation is here, I understand why they are saying this. But in fact, we really don't follow that rules, these rules. Concord, the foundation decided, not recent, uh, a few years ago, that in case of two-dimensional works, works of art, such as paintings, if they are in museums, we are talking about paintings whom themselves are not copyrighted anymore. For example, the Mona Lisa, copyrighted has, it's not copyrighted for many, many years. Now, Nato da Vinci died more than 70 years ago. If the Louvre decided that the image is copyrighted, we are not going to care about it. We're going to allow upload of the photo, even if the photo is in the Louvre's website, and ignoring local laws. You can have countries where the local law says that the image taken, the derivative image, the secondary image taken from a, an artwork in the public domain, it's still copyrighted. The US law says there is no original, originality, which means it is free in the US. But here we are ignoring local laws and allowing pictures, despite the previous rules, which I just mentioned. Um, this is not going to be a theoretical le lecture. I'm going to give lots of examples now and so show you some conflicts. 
But I just want to lay down the groundwork, the legal groundwork that we know what we are talking about. So when the foundation wants it, we can ignore local laws or even sometimes ignore US laws. <laughs> just a rule of thumb, US law is really complicated. I have this chart from uh, uh, English Wikipedia. You see how the graph goes higher and higher. Right now, it started with copyright for 25 years, then it went out to 45, to 55, to 75, 85, 110, 111. It seems that works of art in the United States never lose their copyright. They just stay protected. I guess as long as commercial companies have these copyrights, that will be the case. Other countries, usually it's much simpler. It's 70 years from the death of the author, or sometimes no copyright at all. For example, Freedom of Panorama, which I will talk about. Just one question, when, how much time do I have? Well, I'll, I'll let you know. I, I think we're going to go until 314 or 319. Okay, 19, uh, 419. 419 oh, 40. is better. Okay. Um, US law, very problematic, very restrictive compared to other countries. Now, there are several problems about this. There are several, several legal definitions that uh, may apply. First of all, we can have conf conflicts in copyright terms. One country can say 50 years, another 70, another 25. Freedom of panorama, something not clearly defined in many countries. Some countries have the concept but not use the term. Others do not have it at all. In others, it is very wide. There is the concept of de minimis, which is defined in every country differently. And what is free because of de minimis in one country is not free in another. Basically, de minimis it means that the breach of copyright is so small, the courts are not going to hustle about it. And it means, actually, that there is no copyright. The law says that in such cases, there is no copyright for work of art. And there is a question for interpretation. One country can say that a work of art is original, another say it cannot. I will give, bring some examples of that to show you, but it is an inter interpretation done by the court in every country, and it can be different. Um, there is one tool that is used by countries to try and sort out this problem between themselves, which is the Berne Convention. Many countries are signatory to it, even the US, though in some cases it is not, does not apply in the US. It defines when, when works of art are eligible for copyright, it defines basically base, base its definition on the nationality of the author, its residence, when the work was published, and was it, whether it was publi published simultaneously in several countries. And then it says, if this author lived in London, we apply the UK law, unless the work was published for the first time in France, in which case we will apply the French law. Uh, several rules. And then we know what is the copyright. Um, one more comment. The Berne Convention usually has what is sometimes called the shorter term rules. Because we have many conflicts, one country would say 30 years, another 70, the Berne Convention say that we need to use the shorter term of the two in order to avoid cases where a work is protected in one country and completely free in another. Um, there are two main elements that we are talking about, the place of publication and the le length of protection, which is usually from publication or from the death of the author. I want to give some example. I'm going to start with freedom of panorama. Some countries have it, others don't. Uh, for example, US, buildings are free. Statues in the public domain are not. Uh, paintings are not. Uh, common law countries, are both, all of them base their laws on the UK law. It's the copyright law of 1911. Um, King George IV, I think, signed it. And uh, they, it's, it's quite broad. It says buildings, statues, and According to some interpretation, 3D artistic work are free if they are in the, in the general public view. Um, if I go to modern understanding of this concept, if I'm walking in the street and I see something in the public area, I see a building, I see a statue, I see a work of art, I can look at it freely. That's understood. But I want somebody that, I, that was st stayed at home, couldn't afford the plane ticket, to see it as well. So I take a picture and bring it to him. You can say it's fair use, but the idea is if I can see it, somebody else can see it as well. So I can take pictures of three-dimensional dimensional works of art. Germany and Switzerland, the concept arises from other laws, not uh, the common law, but they do allow buildings and statues uh, which are in public areas to be photographed. France and Italy don't have this concept. Israel is really wide because of the way the UK law from 1911 was interpreted. Basically, they check what the original intent was in the UK, they wanted artists to copy other works of arts, mostly in other countries. So arts and crafts are free from copyright if they are in the public domain. So uh, anything that is useful, arts and crafts is useful, is free. There is freedom of panorama in Israel. 
Some example. This is a nice statue. It's called Modern Head. It's by Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, he died 13 years ago. The statue is in New York. The image is in Commons. I'm not sure why. We need to wait 70 years, I think. Yeah, okay, something like that. But let's suppose we are applying the current US law. It's there. Same statue is in Yale. Now, something interesting happened to this uh, artwork. It was purchased uh, and was brought to Israel as a memorial to Yitzhak Rabin. There it is now in the, the Jerusalem Municipal Square. According to Israeli copyright law, it was in 1911. It was reenacted in 2007, this time in Hebrew. And this is a translation of the law. Any uh, drawing, photography, sketch, similar visual description of arch architectural, architectural work, sculpture, or useful art is permitted, which means basically it is not copyrighted. You cannot make three-dimensional copies of such works of art. That is protected. But two-dimensional images are allowed. So anybody can take a picture of this statue, whether or not it is copyrighted in the US. Uh, another example. Robert Indiana, probably this is the same case why the picture is allowed in the commons. We have this picture called Love. It has a nice article in Wikipedia about it. It was done in copies of it are placed in many places around the country. There is even a stamp showing this. Um, if we are using the current US uh, copyright law, it is protected. The stamp is protected. No, but if it, the statue would, would have been done today, uh, he, he, he is still alive. It should be copyrighted for 110 years from now. Um, but he did make a, one copy of his statue uniquely in Hebrew for the Israel Museum. He made it knowing it would be displayed in the Israel Museum. He made it to be placed in a certain spot. They actually built a square just for this statue. So in his mind, when he made it, he sent it to a country in which he should know that there is no copyright for statues. And anybody can take a picture of this statue. The Israel Museum is really strict, doesn't allow photography on its grounds, except around the area of the statue. They do allow that. The two-dimensional objects, they do not allow, even if they are a public domain. This goes back to jean Frederic lecture in the last session, that work that is really not, should not be protected, they don't allow to photograph, but the statues, they do allow. Third example, Anish Kapoor, he, is, he, does, he lives in the UK. The UK law is more stable than the US law. It is 70 years from the death of the uh, the creator of a sculpture, and he's still alive. Makes great work. Um, one of his uh, nicer statues is Cloud Gate in Chicago. There is also one in, uh, in New York, uh, in Rockefeller Center. My understanding is that all these images, except perhaps for this one, this one, fall under the de minimis clause. The image is in the background. Here is the child, is the object. Do you see the, the marker? The child is the main object, so the statue is on the side. Here we can't really see the statues behind the buildings and the people. This is a reflection. So the statue itself is not the main object of the painting, but one of them, it is. I know there is a person in the middle, but you still see the statues most of, in most of the picture. We'll do, we'll, no, we'll do question at the end, okay? Um, but uh, Anish Kapoor made one statue, again, to be presented in the Israel Museum. The statue is called Turning the World Upside Down Jerusalem, or in Jerusalem. The name actually appears in Hebrew. So it is clear that this statue, <coughs> statue was meant to be there, and it is photographed in commons. Uh, even though the sculpture lives in the UK, uh, made the statue in the UK, and then it was sent to Israel. And this is okay according to Israeli law. There's no problem to take pictures of this statue. Third and last example in this series of examples, um, Santiago Calatrava. He's not a sculptor. This is from the Wikipedia article, the first paragraph. It says he's a sculptor, but really he builds bridges. It just looks so weir weird, so he can, can be considered a sculptor. One of his bridges is the Constitution Bridge in Venice. It took many years to build it. The bridge is copyrighted. It is understood by Commons contributor that this bridge is copyrighted and no photographs of it should be in Commons because Italy does not have freedom of panorama for buildings. Which means that unless the bridge is the minimis, for example, this picture, the bridge is just this tiny section at the end, and actually the building is the main object of the picture, if the bridge is in the middle of the picture, it should not be in Commons because this is picture in breach of copyright. Um, Actually, all these pictures, except the middle one, are in breach of copyright. And the big sign at the top of the page says so. However, 
Calatrava, who lives in Switzerland, um, built also this nice statue. It's the Jerusalem Courts Bridge. It's an exact copy of another bridge that looks exactly like this in a, in a country where there is copyright for buildings, but in Jerusalem there is not. Building or statues, whatever it is. So all these pictures are allowed. I want to do a short summary. Basically, if you're a sculpturer who is alive today, his work in the US is copyright, in Israel it is free. Um, also in Italy, uh, depending if you have uh, uh, copyright on building or statues, the images may be free or not free. OK, um, a quick summary of the legal aspects. Freedom of Panorama changes from one country to another. It may be changing for the same object. If I move it from one country to another, usually the Berne Convention and the local laws do treat a case where you bring an object temporarily. The Freedom of Panorama does not apply to object moved temporarily. You go to the Metropolitan, you see that um, exhibitions that are temporary there are not allowed to be photographed in, because that's one of the reasons. They also want to make money off the books they sell for the special exhibitions. But temporary objects do, are not subject to this change. But if an object is permanently moved to another country, the freedom of the panorama in the other country would apply to it according to the laws of that country, not necessarily according to US law. So the freedom of panorama may change for one object or another depending on where it is placed. And it may apply differently to building statues applied out to the object based on the definition of law. New Zealand law, Australian law, and UK law use the same sentence, but each co the courts in each country interpreted that sentence a little bit different. And these are countries of case law, and which, which means that the interpretation would be different, and the usage, the, whether it is allowed to photograph or not, may be different in, the same, in different countries, which uses basically the same law. Um, I mentioned threshold of originality. This is a current ongoing uh, deletion uh, debate in the commons. It's ongoing for the past six months, but it's there. Uh, this is a, a moose, I think, from uh, Euro Disney. Uh, there is an argument that this is a statue which cannot be photographed. There is a question whether this is not Mickey Mouse statue. Mickey Mouse is copyrighted. It's a unique image, so is Donald Duck. A giraffe would look like a giraffe any way you put it. Is there ori enough originality to give copyright to this statue, or can you take a picture of it? There are several other examples, like the elephant there. This is, a, is this a garden which you are allowed to be uh, photographed, or are these actually statues made of greenery which are not allowed to be photographed? Um, I'm going to give another example, and I'm going to go to now to the main example of this lecture, where I sh see a problem, and then I will suggest two solutions to solve this problem. I will try and suggest a solution. Maybe later you'll tell me, US law is much more complicated. You can do this. Um, first of all, you have different protection periods. US law keeps changing. Right now, I think it's 110 years if they didn't make it longer. Israeli law changed. It was 50 years until 2008 for pictures. But now it is 70 years from the death of the photographer. I'm going to give an example regarding a certain image that was deleted in commons. Regarding that image, the relevant laws in Poland and Ukraine was 50 years. OK, I'm now going to give that example. There was a picture of a kibbutz in Israel in Bet Alpha. It's, it's not this picture. The original picture was deleted in commons. Uh, but it looks something like this. Um, a mountain with nothing around it. This is the deletion debate. It is very long. Uh, you see the address above if you want to read the entire discussion. Um, I have some simplified facts, because it was much more complicated than that. The image was taken in Israel in 1933. The photographer was a Polish person, domiciled in the Ukraine. Um, he moved to Israel in the late 1940s. He died in 1992. The image was published for the first time in Israel in 2010. Now, this is the interesting bit. The Israel National Archive, um, based on much uh, glam work done by Wikimedia Israel started publishing its archives. It went and checked what are the pictures in the public domain in Israel. Israel, it is, was, the relevant time was 50 years. So anything that was photographed before 1958 is free. It is in the public domain. And they started uploading it as public domain images for the general public to use. We had a bot that went over these images and moved them to commons. Being in the public domain, we want common user to use it on Wikipedias. These are historical images. Some of them have importance. So th that was the, the background for uploading the, the picture to commons. 
Then the family, one of the family members, jumped in the comments and said, this photo must be deleted. It is protected under US copyright law. It was originally created before January 1st, 1978, but it was not published or registered by that date according to the US law. And therefore, it should be deleted from the commons because it is protected in the US. Um, there was a question of taking down copyrights that, uh, that was added to the image. You can do it because it was published as public domain and in commons usually you put the copyright in the description of the image and not on the image itself. So it was cropped a bit and the name of the photographer, the credit was given. It was deleted in commons based on the fact that it is, um, it is copyrighted in the US. I want to argue now, I, I want to say two things. First of all, this is quite a hindrance for all glam work. Um, you upload, ooh, then I, okay, I'll jump ahead. You scared me with the time. Uh, okay, according to the Bern Convention, this image was free, as you can see below. First of place of publication, domicile, nationality, place where the picture of taken, domicile of the author when it was published, it was dead indeed, but if you go according, it is, it is free in all these countries. It was deleted, the argument was this image was first published in the US, full commons, in 2010, which means that the law protecting it in the US applies, and this means that if work of art were never published, and you waited until they, the copyright expired in the original countries, and only then you uploaded them to commons, they receive protection in the US. You have to wait 70 years from the death of the author, or 210, because this is how it is in the US. Uh, I see you're saying no, but... <laughs> No, it was published in Israel because it was in the public domain. They waited. The Israel National Archive published only images that were in the, national, in the public domain. They waited for the picture to be in the public domain in order to publish it. The question of clarification, where is that, where is that result attested? I mean, is that, is that a deletion, a result of a deletion decision? Yeah, that's it's a deletion the, vote, yeah. That's the deletion vote. Okay. okay. We have many works of art that are copyrighted in Israel. We do glam work, we convince the artists to allow publication of them. So in Israel, this work of art is free now. It, the art is still alive. Because of glam work done by Wikimedia Israel, we have a Wikimedia in residence, he called the artist, convinced him to waive copyright, and it is published. But if the US law is stronger than, the Israeli law allows waiver of such copyright. But if the US law would become stronger, this means this image once published in the commons become copyrighted again in the US and should be deleted. Um, some solutions. First of all, move the servers to Europe. You can say it's impossible. The foundation says, oh no, we're going to be liable in, in Holland. I can give another lecture why they will be liable in Holland anyway. But we have servers, the mirror servers are in Holland. So we can just switch the two. I want to give brief legal answers. There are two principles. One is private international law and one is foreign non-convenience. Basically, it's a doctrine which says sometimes court in one country would not intervene if the issue should be heard by another country. Courts do not like forum shopping. If I can get compensation in one country and double comp uh, compensation in another, the courts do not want all the people to go to the other uh, domicile to file claims. You should file a claim in one country. Uh, th this is taken from Wikipedia. Um, this this uh, principle exists in US law, it exists in all countries law. This is a, a US case, it says if local interest is having uh, localized controversies heard at home in foreign countries. Uh, this is copyright cases, by the way. This is quotation from copyright cases where the Singapore copyright law was supposed to be applied and the US court said the sent the claim to be heard in Singapore. Several other cases, you will have the rest of references later. Um, the point is that the US courts do not want to be entangled in legal issues that are not known to them. They don't want to learn other countries' law. They want these laws to be heard by the, court, uh, the competent courts that know these laws. Let's go back to the Beta Alpha picture. Again, the image was taken, the photographer was Polish, he was domiciled in Israel, first publicized in Israel, and the claimant, the people shouting, this is my copyright, lives in Israel, and the uploader lives in Israel. Now, you're going to tell me there is one more party, the defendant, Wikimedia Foundation. But we'll see that it is not really relevant. What is the convenient forum and what is the applicable law according to US law? We have these parties. 
uh, to the claim. So as long as we have the Wikimedia Foundation there, we have a problem. There is one party in the US. There is this US claim, well known, the YouTube claim. I, I, know if you, I don't know if you are familiar with it. A, a, babe, a woman took a picture of her baby dancing to music by Prince. The copyright owner filed a, a notice, said this is breach of copyright. YouTube took down the I video. The woman filed a counter notice saying, no, this is free. <coughs> and uh, YouTube re reposted the video again. The idea of notice and counter notice is based on this US law, Online Copyright Infringement Liability Limitation Act, which means if you're a service provider, you can have this mechanism protecting you. You publish the information given to you by the public. If somebody thinks it's a British copyright, he sends you a notice. You send the notice to the uploader, and if the uploader says, no, it is free, you post the, the image, the movie, back again. This is applies to YouTube. It also applies to Wikimedia Foundation projects. In which case, if the plaintiff send the notice to Wikimedia Foundation, Wikimedia Foundation will send the notice to the uploader. The uploader may send the counter notice, and then the Wikimedia Foundation is out of the picture. We have a claim between two parties, the plaintiff and the uploader, and they can fight it, each other. The image may stay in commons. In, in, in a case, both of them are Israeli, then I go back to the uh, principle of form non-convenience. Everybody is Israeli, and then the convenient form, according to US law, is Israeli, and the applicable law in US court, according to US law, is Israeli. There, was cl there were claims in which the party said, I cannot go to the other country to do the claim over there for various of personal safety. And the US court, the New York court, held the, the claim according to the Egyptian law in that example. So a US court would apply the Israeli law, which originally said that the uh, picture is in the public domain. Um, my suggestions. Um, I think that the U.S. law in such cases is not that important because according to U.S. law, full non-convenience and the applicable law, law would apply only the local law. And just another comment, if you are a service provider, it's a bet it is better to have less um, scrutiny because the more scrutiny that you are doing, the more responsibility, legal responsibility that you have. A sign like we have in the Calatrava Bridge, images of this bridge should not be uploaded, it should not be uploaded is okay. But uh, we shouldn't go and start arguing legal uh, points of foreign law, because the more you argue, the more legal respons responsibility the Wikimedia Foundation have and the uploaders will have. Okay, any questions? Um, there's a kind of awkward position with the WMF legal team and users in that <coughs> There is no, I mean, there really isn't a well-defined agreement as to when the WMF is going to step in and defend people that are using their services and when there isn't. Um, the, 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 the concern I have with your strategy is there are people who would be scared away from uploading if they thought, if I make a good faith mistake, there is a chance that I will be thrown into court with no support from the WMF. Um, that does exist anyways. A claim may be filed against the uploader anyways, and he may be thrown into court anyway. The fact that you upload an image, you usually sign, you click, I am the copyright owner, or I know this copyright to be in the public domain. It is a contract between you and the Wikimedia Foundation that's making you responsible for any image you upload. It's there anyway. And I'm not talking about Wikimedia Foundation policies or what they can do or should do. But it's there. What I'm saying is we shouldn't argue too much about these laws and try to interpret them too much. You have a mechanism in US law how to handle these cases. We should just follow this. If there is a the, uh, notification, counter notification. If you are scared and somebody sends you an email, this is in breach, you can just delete the picture and not issue the counter notification. But if you think it is free, you should fight it. You should say, no, let that guy sue. Well, people have fought it. I mean, the Derek Coetzee, um, versus the British Portrait Museum, I think? National Gallery, yeah. Oh, um, that one was a case where they fought it and the WMF supported it, but I, I just worry that we're going to be put into the position where the WMF is going to be told they can't have it both ways. They can't both pass it on, pa bypass the WMF and give it to the users and at the same time support the users because then they're back to being party. They have, they have a, a mechanism to do that. It's legally defined, and it's, it's, it is sufficient for them. It gives them a protection. And I, I do not think we should have this lengthy the, the discussion page over the, the Betapa picture is, 
dozens of pages long. We shouldn't do this discussion. If the copy of, by the way, in, I, I simplified the facts, but there were two cousins there fighting. Each of them said he was the copyright owner. And the other cousin was the one who uploaded the picture to Wikipedia in the first place. And the, so we shouldn't get, actually what we got, in, we got into a fight between two cousins, whether there is or is not a copyright law, and we shouldn't do that. We should have told them, go to court and fight it amongst yourselves. Okay, but, but just, just to, to clarify, um, you know, there's a difference between the WMF and its employees and just members of the public debating. So one could argue that if a bunch of people, all users, make legal arguments and talk among themselves on common, commons talk pages or deletion pages, that's different from the WMF. I mean, we have Moonrin Girl as a WMF employee now and so on, but assuming that those employees don't participate in the debate, it, it doesn't, I don't think it would hurt the safe harbor argument. It's just more user, user discussions, that, not, that not binding on the, the foundation. That, that depends on the country, because in some countries, if you have uh, like a blog, the most scrutiny you're having inside the blog by the blog managers... But, but they're not the blog managers. The WMF no, is no, not... the WMF is the blog owner, the domain owner. The blog managers are the volunteers. Well, right now, when the WMF gets DMCA takedown notices, regardless of who did the upload, the WMF fights them. If they use your strategy, if they just say, we're going to bypass ourselves entirely and give it directly to the the uploader. Can they then, my concern is that they will stop fighting the takedowns once they have to pass it on to other people. I'm, I'm not talking about that. In this case, this was all handled in the top page. The old argument, there was no notice, no official notice to Wikimedia Foundation. So it's not exactly the case. And I think that the user in the talk page should not st start debating the legality and whether the Ukraine law applied in Poland in 1933, which happened in this case, uh, a month ago. Okay, Bradley, we're back and forth. We have another question. Okay. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm wondering about validating, one, validating the identity of the uploader. Uh, a, a lot of the, most of the Wiki PP people on Wikipedia don't even use their real names uh, as being the up as uploading files. And uh, often when pictures are taken, they're taken by somebody else. Uh, and um, you're attesting that, uh, that, that it's, con that it's uh, free property or you take the picture yourself or some, somebody else takes it or somebody gives you the picture and say, please upload this for me and, um, and you upload it and uh, you may not even be, uh, uh, e even if you are, um, in my case I happen to be um, uh, posting under my own name but uh, many, most people aren't. So uh, how do you address those issues? The issues are there. Uh, when you upload a picture, you have an email, you sign basically a contract with the foundation. So, and, and the foundation can uplift, if, even if it's an IP, can, f can find the IP. There are legal ma methods and technical methods to, to handle this. It's not a problem. And if somebody contests, uh, somebody sends a notice, you can always take down the picture. You send the notice to the user, and if he doesn't contest this, then it, the, the picture remains down. That's according to the law. Uh, but we are not talking, my point was that Mostly the users should not start debating the, the points and start arguing whether such laws apply. We should stick to the legal mechanism and take into account that in most cases the US law would not apply. Um, I do agree with, with what you said uh, around the legal thing because uh, I had one picture that I put on comments that wasn't free and I realized that after I uploaded it and it was a good fate error. And uh, I had to ask uh, some admin from comments to delete it and I, I wonder what is the responsibility responsibility in this process because as I uh, uh, saw that the, the picture wasn't free and now it's out of my hand I uh, signal that it wasn't free and I asked for it but it stayed there for like uh, two to three months and what is my responsibility when I do this kind of good faith error? And then I want to turn it back, but there's no one in the process uh, work that can do it or it stays there. And then someone else can use my picture and get involved in this thing. So what is the responsibility in this thing? Well, most laws that I know, when the UK law does that, Australia, New Zealand, Israeli law, I think the US law as well, um, 
gives you the protection of good faith mistake. You are not liable. And if somebody else copied the picture while it was up there, they are not liable as well. But everybody would have to take it down once there is a notice. But there is no problem with that. Uh, I have to say I'm also against the idea of not applying the US law and simply uploading pictures um, when it's okay under the local law because the reason for comments to apply two laws is to be certain that uh, an image can be uploaded and otherwise it would certainly increase the risk of uh, copyright infringements, it would create costs for the processes and it would uh, certainly damage the uh, credibility of the Wikipedia projects if we upload pictures simply because we don't want to have long discussions before we do so. If we do something dangerous and uploading millions of pictures which are copyrighted under certain law and not under other laws is something dangerous, then we have to be careful because it is a question of credibility and of costs that Commons has opted to apply also the US law which still is highly probable to apply in a process. Yes, the microphone. Do you have a response to that? Oh, well, my point is not necessarily, because I would say that a US court will not apply the US laws in these cases, according to US law. Not always the US copyright law would apply. But, but you cannot be certain about that. You cannot be certain about many things. You can say that the picture is de minimis, while it is not. It will be decided eventually in court. But you, the, 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 you don't upload the picture and then look what the cost will eventually have to take. No, but the the let's, let's stop the back and forth yeah. and take the next question, Joe. So we can simplify this pretty substantially by going back to one of the basic core points behind what Commons is for. So the purpose of Commons is to build a repository of media which can be freely used for a very broad variety of applications, including ones far outside of Wikipedia. And this is all established on Commons. So that means that we don't generally accept a work that could be used for our use but couldn't be used commercially, or could be used for our use but couldn't be converted into a 3D output. And so that's one of the reasons that the community takes a very uh, strong stance on trying to do the best that we can to make sure that the repository is actually persistently and permanently useful for those applications. And so yes, while we could play a whack-a-mole using the notice and takedown procedure, and upload as many copyrighted things as we can until you know Congress takes away that that escape valve. Uh, that's not what we're trying to accomplish on Commons, and so that's why uh, we do try to apply stronger criteria. And in, in related to that, um, the safe harbors, at least under U.S. law, were created specifically so that service providers would not have to blind their eyes. So the advice that service providers have to stay away from making calls and, and being involved is a is bad advice in the US. Well, what I'm saying is that I'm not telling you to ignore the US copyright law. I'm just saying that in some cases, US law, not US copyright law, but US law would apply other countries' copyright law. Or would this allow the claim altogether based on the principle of public international law, which is part of US law. It's part of US federal law. Sometimes the U.S. copyright law should not be applied at all, and I think these are these cases. One of these cases. All right. Uh, on our part, uh, I agree with you that uh, we have to uh, uh, apply local laws in certain so certain situations. However, as the case may be for the Philippines, is that uh, as a chapter we have been fighting with Wikimedia Commons, as people there have been interpreting Philippine laws differently. I mean. Uh, on our end as a chapter, we have worked together with, internet, uh, with our intellectual property office, which has confirmed that there is freedom of panorama, but we, uh, we don't call it as such. However, the people in Commons would say otherwise. So uh, how can we actually reach a, uh, a situation wherein we could dictate to them that this must be done because we already have confirmed it through the government agency responsible for this. However, they are not taking that as uh, a uh, credible source for us to base our claim. Um, uh, well, that, to answer that, there was a lecture given in Haifa last year. There was a problem with the Israeli copyright law. One of uh, Commons users claimed that there is no freedom of panorama in Israel. And basically, Wikimedia Israel got a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation and it got a legal uh, document issued by the topmost expert to saying that there is freedom of panorama in Israel. Uh, and even that didn't convince that Commons user. Eventually, it was blocked for another reason. But 
-hmm. I do not think it should go to arguments in commons whether there is or is not Fino Panorama. And I do think that the foundation should set some ground rules on such big issues. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to add that one of your remedies is always to upload the image to your own local, you know, Philippine, uh, Philippine um, image thing. That the Commons is, is just one thing. For example, you can upload an image to English Wikipedia or Philippine Wikipedia, or whatever. Um, and but the then other the foundation is liable just as the same. Yes, right. But but but. Well, if Commons won't take it. That's a soft gap for dealing with different communities. It is, right. Th it, thank you. Uh, the, the other point was it wasn't Mickey Mouse, it was a Mary Baker Eddy is the one that constantly causes us to keep on extending the U.S. copyright. We've been <laughs> extending U.S. copyright long before Mickey Mouse was very popular. We're going to take this gentleman's last question and we'll go to our second speaker and we'll have more questions at the end. So, um, I think that it's quite common that Copyright law says that a previously not published book or picture uh, gets a copyright from the date when it's first published. Is this uh, different? You said this is the case in the US, but is it different in Israel? Yeah, the copyright in Israel is from the date of creation of the work of art. And this is the same right. issue. It, it, sometimes the Berne Convention says that as well. For picture, it's from the date of taking the picture. So if 50 years from the date the picture was taken. So we just checked the date that the picture was taken. So, so if we have an image archive in Sweden uh, where old unpublished images are put online, we risk uh, creating a new copyright. Maybe we should publish them in Israel first? No, Would that help? No, <laughs> the question of, like, go back to the Berne Convention, is the question of the domicile of the author and the first, the, it would apply the Swedish law also in Israel. The same, which I'm arguing that the Israeli law should be applied in the U.S. Okay. Let's give Mr. Avi a, a round of applause. I have a question slightly, slightly related. Um, yeah, I guess for you. Um, very recently, although recently is a relative term, oh, um, there was a there was an incident on English Wikipedia and on Commons where we started to publish Iranian photos because the United States and Iran do not have an existing an existing copyright agreement. Therefore, um, it is not copyrighted at all in the United States, even if it's copyrighted currently in Iran. And so there became this huge ethical legal conundrum in that legally we were able to publish the photos from Iran because of the, the lack of, of a treaty. But ethically, it was dubious. And I guess I will re-ask the question because he is now online. Well, I can answer you in several ways quickly. But we have all time because Tal is not here. Um, basically, according to Commons policy, you should not upload the pictures because you right. have to follow both local law and the US law. It is true that the US law in those countries it doesn't like uh, uh, copyright. Um, other countries, by the way, do not ignore other countries. Uh, I, for example, if you would file in Israel a claim for breach of copyright of an image from Syria and Lebanon, the court would hear it. I think they would actually apply the Syrian law or the Lebanese law based on this concept. But uh, um, if we go by Commons policy, you, have, uh, you need not to follow the US law in that case. You need to keep the copyrights. Uh, and you need to, to take in mind that claims may be filed also in other countries. Uh, claims may be filed against the uploader in the UK and also against the Wikimedia Foundation. Claims may be filed in the UK. I did have a discussion with foundation staff whether they well, can be party to a claim in other countries. It's a matter of, of question to be decided by the courts. So I, I, it was never tested before. Let's go to Greg C. and his, his presentation, which now apparently is on the screen. and. Cool. Well, thank you. Hello, I'm Greg Grossmeyer. I'm from Creative Commons. Um, but, disclaimer time. Um, so, yay. I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Oh my god, what the fuck brought you? So, <laughs> right. I'm not going to be giving, sorry, I move too much. Um, I'm not going to be giving you a lot of answers. I'm more, or not answers to some of the 
uh, more tricky questions. I'm going to focus on the, the questions that we know pretty decently from one perspective at least. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, some caveats, right? So I'm US centric um, and I'm only really addressing the stuff that you create, not stuff that other people are creating. Um, but why, why me? Um, so previous jobs, I was the copyright specialist at the University of Michigan Library, um, and also an open education specialist at the University of Michigan um, OER project called Open Michigan. So I have a decent background. Like at, at the University of Michigan Library, I was the person answering the copyright at UMich at EDU email address. So if you had a question about that as a faculty or staff or student or whoever, I was the one giving you not answers. I was the one giving you <laughs> suggestions and tips. Um, I was not giving legal advice, but I you know, was doing that role. Uh, current role is education and technology, education technology and policy coordinator at Creative Commons. Um, so kind of switch gears a little bit more, focusing on education, um, but still obviously in this world of openness. Um, so quick, 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 real quick refresher on Creative Commons. I'm assuming that no one is here that doesn't know what Creative Commons is, right? And, and actually. It's okay, raise your hand, maybe go like this and kind of wink at me if you don't. All right, all right. Yeah. So, <laughs> Creative Commons supplies a suite of licenses that you can use and apply to your works so that you can tell others how they can and cannot use your work, right? Pretty straightforward. So there's default copyright, but then there's these licenses that clarify what rights you want to reserve and what rights you want others to be able to make use of. Um, so this is our suite of licenses plus the public domain mark plus the CC0 waiver. Um, so let's start at the bottom. Um, so, right, I'll put the names next to them so you can make sense of me. So at the bottom, attribution non-commercial no derivatives means you, if you want to use this, you have to get attribution, you can't use it commercially, whatever the hell commercially means, and no derivatives, you can't make derivatives, which is actually legally defined in the local law. So derivatives is not defined in Creative Commons licenses, they're defined in US copyright law or UK copyright law or whatever, but you just can't make derivatives of something. So then attribution of derivatives, attribution on commercial share alike. So if you make a derivative of it, the derivative must also be under the same license that share alike means. Um, attribution on commercial, attribution share alike, attribution only. And then Creative Commons Zero, that's one of these special ones, which is not a license, it's a waiver with a fallback license, but it's not a license. Um, it, it basically waives all rights that it possibly can in whatever jurisdiction you're in to the maximal extent by copyright law, wherever you are. In some cases, you can't do that fully. Like in France, you can't get rid of your moral rights. You just can't do it. Um, it's not legally possible. So that's why there's a fallback license on that that says you can do what you want and I promise not to sue you, basically. Um, and then the public domain mark, which is just for saying this thing right here, I, Greg Grossmeyer, I'm pretty sure this thing is in the public domain, so I'm gonna put a little image next to it. So, you know, we, everybody has, everybody can say something is in the public domain. What this adds is basically the, the metadata and, and branding that Creative Commons brings to things. So, not only do we have a pretty recognizable brand, but we also, and all of our tools incorporate metadata, which allows search engines and other platforms to easily understand what is being described. So that's one of the benefits of that mark. So from an OER perspective, open educational resources perspective, or the last two you can't use, right? Because the whole point of OER is to making remixes of something, right? You don't want to release your open textbook under a node or his license, because that means no one can make any improvements to it. And that's kind of worthless in that community. So I kind of did a little spectrum. Maybe I shouldn't have, but you know, really great, pretty good, no, all right, and then no, right? For Wikipedia, it's even more restrictive, right? So you can't limit by uh, commercial use. So that's why those are now in red. So basically, we're left with, with these guys. And those are the good ones. Everyone should be happy about those. All right, so let's start off with these. Um, so again, remember my caveats, I'm fairly US-centric and talking about things that you're creating and not other people's things. So. Um, you should also use these licenses for things that are not a derivative of something else. So obviously, if, if you make a derivative of something else, use what that original license was under. So let's take an example. Um, let's say, you know, a Chuck Close painting. If you make a derivative of a Chuck, so Chuck Close is the guy that does really big blow-ups of his face and other things, like, you know, massive, like, 
20 foot by 20 foot paintings that he does of really detailed stuff. Um, still alive, I believe, but either way, his stuff is in the copyright, and still protected by copyright. Um, if you make a derivative of that, <laughs> don't use a Creative Commons license on it because that's, that's not your copyright. Um, but between attribution and attribution share alike, that's kind of a personal decision, and, and we can talk about that if you want to see the, the relative merits or benefits of either one. Does anyone have any strong feelings of share alike versus non share alike here? I'm sure, there's someone. Yes. Yes. Sure. Which way? Copy left, left, copy left licenses are grand. Go beards. Yes. <laughs> this is kind of a correlation there, I believe. Uh, <laughs> no offense. That one too. Um, so, right. Uh, in the, does anybody have any questions about these two situations? Well, okay. Yes. I was just wondering if you're um, just CC BOT instead of right. BYSA, then you essentially can actually just someone can just take your CC stuff into uh, either a directory or something into something copyrighted. Yes. Is that what? Well, that's what I. That that's one of the possible things that could happen in that situation. So. You could, for instance, imagine you know your your music or your image is being used in a commercial from Coca-Cola, and they can restrict the whole commercial under you know all rights reserved or whatever they're doing. Um, but your little bit is always they can't remove your Creative Commons license. That's that they, it's not in their purview, but it's not affecting any other part of that commercial. Does that layerness distinction make sense? So you're defining attribution not the way an academic would have been, say it's academic integrity, but it's the way the copyright law would. So academics care a lot about ideas and other things in, in attribution. That's all excluded from this concept of attribution, isn't that correct? So I, I don't, I think they're, they're um, sure. <laughs> um, basically, to use a work that's under, under copyright, you're basically required to provide a copyright notice if you if you reuse something. And this is just codifying that in a way that says, so I can bring up the code if you want me to, the actual legal document that tells you how you need to attribute a work that's under Creative Commons. And you gotta get the name and where you found it and the name of the person that created it and that kind of stuff within reason in your medium. Like if you're doing a, a uh, printout of something, you might not want to include a really long URL, so you might not do that. But um, in academia, right, there are social norms, which aren't codified in law, they're just the way things are in a way, right? They're written standards of academic integrity and the national mm -hmm. association. Right, 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 right. It's just a, it's a small subset of the concept of that. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's uh, one of the discussions, I don't know how many of you were in the, the previous legal discussion, session in the smaller room, where there was talk about um, that, that issue in a way. Um, and we ran into that a lot with CC0, and I'll get to that in a second, but, so remind me to bring that back up when I get to CC0. <laughs> um, ah, I'm there, all right, so CC0, this is the one that where you waive all rights that you, you can possibly under whatever jurisdiction you're in. Um, so again, it's for something that you created, you can't obviously waive someone else's rights, um, and it's not derivative of something else, and it's great for not claiming hypothetical or thin copyright situations, right? So, for example, if you live in the UK and, and you take and you make a scan of a 2D artwork, someone somewhere is going to argue that there's copyright in that, right? That's what some NPG was kind of doing, and the sweat of the brow. Um, then you can, if you have a collection of these things, you can claim database directive, um, database rights. So when it's not really clear about the situation, the publisher of that content can use CC0 to just make it clear, hey, I'm not going to claim any of these concepts like sweat of the brow or database rights in this in any way. I'm, I'm relinquishing all these rights. Um, and also, obviously, it, it maximizes reuse potential um, in, in a way that, that nothing else really can. Um, so we really recommend this in the science field because science data especially really gets <coughs> used when, or is, is really, um, um, you can see the benefits of it when it's used by more people and used in new contexts that you didn't see, right? Taking a data set from over here and a data set from over here, these two researchers had never seen each other. They're actually from different disciplines, but with their two data sets, you can 
learn something really special, right? The, the inner overlays of information. But to do that, you can't especially have things like share alike and, and especially uh, different share alike licenses. So there's another uh, organization that provides licenses, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation, that has the Open Database or, or Open Data Commons license, the ODC. And um, they have a, basically an attribution and an attribution share alike version of that license. And let's say you release a database under Creative Commons attribution share alike, and that's what this researcher did. And this researcher, researcher over here released it under the ODC ISA license. They can't talk to each other. They can't reuse that data unless it's under fair use or, or some other way, because especially with the ODC licenses, they're actually written not to depend solely on copyright, which is what CC licenses are talking about, but they're written to bring in other aspects of law, like contract law, to restrict the use of the internals of the database. So, so facts aren't protected by copyright, right? I can have a collection of facts, like the you know famous example, Feist v. Rule, um, the phone book situation, right? Each one of those phone numbers and names is not a protected by copyright thing, um, but in, in certain jurisdictions, the database directive, the collection as a whole is protected, right? Um, but if you can get those little bits out, those aren't protected. But using the ODC, that's, that's kind of a little less clear. You get a little question about that, right? Is there any license where you can say, I want to be attribution and share alike, but which share alike doesn't really matter to Oh, me? no. Um, is that coming out in CC4? Good question. And so, um, so he brings up a good, good issue, which is right now there's been three or four licenses, versions of licenses for Creative Commons. Uh, we came back, we came out in 2004 with you know CC0 1.0. There was a 1.5, and then there's a 2.0, or no, sorry, there's 1.0, 2.0, 2.5, and 3.0. We've been at 3.0 for the last about seven years, um, and so we are in the process, and you all should be a part of that especially those of you that have really strong opinions about copyright law in various jurisdictions, <coughs> um, um, and have this discussion <laughs> about what these licenses should address and what they shouldn't and what compatibility issues that are, that are addressing. So one of the main conversations is actually GPL compatibility. For those of you that don't know, the GPL is the Free Software Foundation's um, general public license, which is a copyleft license, uh, predominantly used for source code. Um, can also be used for other content, it's just not maybe the best designed for it, because to use it, you have to reproduce the whole license, which is, you know, yay long. It's actually legally required in the license to reproduce a license in every single uh, copy of a work. So for instance, if you made a, a t-shirt that was GPL, um, the license would be on the back, <laughs> basically. Um, so we're, we're talking about how to, um, make something that is released under attribution share alike and make that ingestible into the GPL, right? There's not gonna be any really way to do two-way compatibility just because the share alike differences are a little bit too nuanced between the two of them and in, in specialized situations where things only make sense in their different communities, software versus content, um, which really shouldn't be a, a versus, but you know, it, whatever. Um, so it's gonna be hard to do two way, but we'll, we'll see by doing one way. So we only have three minutes. But so this is the public domain mark, right? So not something you created, it's in the public domain, um, and in at least some jurisdiction, right? Uh, so GLAM, <clears throat> my recommendations. Assuming you're not gonna be claiming fair use or fair dealing, and it's in the public domain somewhere, the source content is public domain, um, use either the CC0 to relinquish any potential theoretical sort of the brow, anything, or just mark it straight up, this is in the public domain, using the PD mark. Um, some controversial things, so I'll, is the three minutes based off of uh, the original time span, or is it the new? Well, why don't you just go ahead and talk through the whole question, just, just get through the presentation. Got it, got it. All right, so, um, at Open Michigan, we, <laughs> we, we created this uh, uh, case book, where there's a lot of different situations and here's some cases that relate to it. So let's kind of figure out how we can clear content so that you can post it online as an open educational resource and you won't have any issues. And much of it concerned of, concerned with 
um, whether something was protected by copyright or not. That was our main real dis discussion for a very long time. So we had a bunch of different categories looking at, again, disclaimer, 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 I'm not a lawyer, it's not legal advice, et cetera, et cetera. And this is also kind of in that page, you know, this is in draft form, don't take it as any legal advice from the University of Michigan or Open Michigan itself or the medical school or anything else but that. So, all right, first example, pains. Um, the thing that we all can pretty much agree on, two-dimensional skins, uh, from this in public domain, you know, it's in public domain. That's a Chuck Close painting, you don't want to reproduce it. The, my image right here, by the way, is fair use, so don't get mad at me. Um, something like this, which is a chemical representation, or a representation of a chemical structure. Uh, some organizations do claim copyright on that image right there, uh, uh, ACS being one of them, American Cancer, or uh, Chemical Society. Um, we say no, I'm sorry, that there's, this is merger doctrine, you, there's only three different ways of representing this thing and that's it. So no copyright protection whatsoever. Um, same thing with maps and satellite images. Um, so the first one, it's a fictitious map somewhere. So fictitious maps obviously protect by copyright because someone did a lot of creativity to make that. Second one is a satellite photo from you know, way up high no real uh, selection or creativity in that photograph is our argument. Um, also based off of the Meshworks v. Toyota uh, case. So retain, no copyright protection. Topographical map, same thing. By the way, all these cases <laughs> that I, we were citing don't have articles in Wikipedia. So if you're <laughs> geeking out on this stuff, go summarize these articles. There's like five of them that I found that weren't um, that are really, really important in copyright public domain discussions aren't summarized in Wikipedia. So, anyways, restorations. How, who here follows the Commons mailing list? Remember that discussion over the last couple of days? <laughs> Is anyone here involved in that discussion before I say anything? <laughs> Which, who are you? <laughs> yeah. let's, let's leave that again. So, I'm punting on that one, by the way. Not going to touch it. Um, so, question. <laughs> Microphone and first, let's have genuine questions, and then we'll get into the debate in a few minutes. Any genuine questions? Okay, the man with white t shirt. Uh, please forgive me if everybody else here already knows the answer. Uh, when talking about the CC BY and CC BY SA, um, it's clear that if you are recreating something uh, CC BY, you need to give attribution. If you then make a derivative of that object, uh, do you still need to attribute the portion of that you've taken, or is attribution completely waived because it's now derivative? Uh, first, you still need to give attribution in your derivative of an attribution-only object. You know, if I take a song and I make a new, make a remix of that song, that's you know pretty substantial remix. I still need to attribute the original author. Okay, and any other sincere questions? <laughs> since does, does attribution survive after the expiration of the copyright? Uh, no, no. So Creative Commons licenses are dependent upon copyright law, and so of whatever, wherever you are. So 100 years from now, they don't have to mention that I Correct. Right. It's public domain. They, they do not last longer than... than of course, we'll retroactively do that. So. Wait, 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 wait. Four people, you first. It's depending on the local law. Several yeah, countries exactly. do not allow waiver of moral rights. Like right. in France, and there are many countries in which you must always give contribution. Right, so it depends, so Creative Commons is dependent on the local law in which it affects you, wherever your feet are, or whatever happens. Um, so they, it's not extending copyright in any way, and they only make things more free. Okay, so, so any other sincere questions? Okay, yes, the man in striped t-shirts. So the case book that you mm -hmm. showed last year, what was the URL mm -hmm. for that? And did it touch on thin copyright law, like the border between what is a catalog uh, and yeah. what is a literary work? Where, where exactly is that line drawn? Uh, right, so thin copyright. Um, so thin copyright is, a, is a, something we were trying to tease out in these discussions with this case book, right? Um, basically, we were doing a risk analysis at the University of Michigan. That's what all lawyers do, right? They do risk analysis. Um, we all did a risk analysis this morning when we came to this conference. We decided that the chances of us getting hit by a meteorite on the way coming here is low enough that we'll leave the house, right? And that's what lawyers do all the time. Um, fail on my part. That was not closed. Um, 
<laughs> so, not a good risk analysis there. <laughs> um, right, so what we were doing was saying what level of thin copyright were we, the University of Michigan, willing to accept as a risk? Um, where were we going to make a stance that we believe that this is not thick enough, it's thin enough, that if we are sued by whomever, that we will prevail in the court of law. So that, yeah, that's where we were with that. Um, the URL, oh, I didn't put it in here. So it's pretty easy. If you go to uh, open.umich.edu and go to slash wiki slash casebook. Yeah. Open.umich.edu slash wiki slash Facebook. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, again, <laughs> disclaimer, <laughs> this is not legal advice from the University of Michigan or Open Michigan itself. It is, you must look at it in your own context. So feel free to use a bunch of these uh, references that we put in here, the case law especially. Um, Bridgman there, but you know, Morrissey versus Procter & Gamble, Atari versus North American uh, Phillips. Those are really great cases, again, not in Wikipedia. So, right, use it as a great starting point. Now, now, I guess we're ready to, to open up to all questions and comments, and the gentleman over here on this side. How much case law is there on these uh, Creative Commons uh, type of uh, copyright? So if you give up your copyright and it's only for non-commercial use, I mean, how much economic harm could a court find if you're misusing you're not, you're not at, at attributing it. And if there's no economic harm, I mean, to what extent are these things actually enforceable uh, immediately? But the basic question is, you know, how much case law uh, is there and are actually these effective ways to protect attribution? Uh, so there has have been a few cases um, confirming the validity of the Creative Commons licenses. We actually have a wiki page. Um, Right, so there they all are, that in some way reference Creative Commons licenses. Some of them were explicitly about something that was under Creative Commons license. Uh, for instance, the, uh, where is the uh, Dutch one, Curry v. Audix, right? Yeah, the Flickr photo. Um, that one was explicitly about the non-commercial share alike license, and that was upheld in the court of law in the Dutch courts. Um, the Jacobson v. Katzer actually didn't, wasn't about um, Creative Commons licenses, but they mentioned Creative Commons license in the court opinion, the open licenses, e.g. Creative Commons licenses. Um, so there's a bunch of case law that is kind of building itself up around these topics. Um, but, yeah. but the question was, what, what sort of harm and uh, collect? And the answer is that under at least U.S. copyright law, we have statutory damages. Right. So for each instance of of infringement, there's a statutory minimum amount. You don't have to show the economic harm. You're just entitled to at least those dollars, if not more. It's sort of a floor. So if you if you load it up on Wikipedia and a thousand people download that page, it's X dollars times a thousand. <laughs> right. So and to get pedantic, I'm in the right room. Um, the, to get statutory damages, you have to register your copyright in the United States. You have to pay your thirty-five dollars to the U.S. Copyright Office to register your copyright, and you have to do that the day before your court case. <laughs> to then get your statutory damages without registering your copyright, you have to prove actual damages. So there's a benefit for certain parties to register their copyrights. There's a benefit for other parties to not register their copyrights. You still get copyright protection without registering. It's just a formality, so you can then Sorry. yeah. Legally, you can upload something, have it stolen, then mm. initiate legal action, and then no register the day before you initiate legal action. Mm. Or actually, so it's you have to register. Sorry, I, I misspoke. I'll be re pedantic and fix my pedanticness. Register it before the the um, act of infringement. Okay. So you can create it. You can wait a while. You can register it. Someone will then. Oh, make it, yeah, yeah. Then you get statutory damages. Right. Okay. Next question. Yes, sir. It's not a question, but an annotation. Uh, a lot of, lot of photos under public domain and got questions by um, newspapers and so on. How can I use it? What should I do? How can I use your picture? What 
should have read what it should be underlined. And then I started to publish it by um, CC BY, and this was much easier. I got no question. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Wait, so there were images that you that you created or you, you found somewhere else or were in the public domain? Photos I made. You made, and yeah. you wanted to put them in the public domain. No, I have an easier life since I do it not under public domain, but CC right. BY. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Because of people coming in and questioning the, the status of it, or yeah. So in that case, I would recommend the use of CC zero, and because it's fairly, pretty well regarded in the wider community that it's pretty solid, right? Um, it, it's it was written by some pretty smart lawyers, and you know tries to fit all the different edge cases out there. Um, so, yeah. And if they have a problem with CC zero, then you give them a call and talk to us. Okay. So, so any other questions or comments? Okay, well, seeing none, let's give both of our presenters another round of applause. <laughs>